very much for the Diggers Forum for organising this session. You'll see why as we go through this, why I think this is a really timely invite for us because we also subscribe very wholeheartedly to that statement about practitioner things. So just a bit of background to start with. Um, University of Central Anchorage has been teaching our undergraduate archaeology since 2004 um, and we've always had a significant fieldwork element to the degree because we like it. Uh, we do it because it's good fun, the students love it, uh, it's what people think about when they think about archaeology, is fieldwork and particularly they think about excavation. So we've always run lots of digs, but that's not exactly the same as turning out competent professional archaeologists. It's a good starting point, but it's not the same place. Um, what we've been doing over the last eight years or so is actively trying to align what we do with the requirement to turn out employable professional archaeologists. So we're digging a lot of holes. This is the um, Banjar enclosure in Oxfordshire, excavated by our undergraduates in... Don't we do that? It's about four years ago now, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but we try to work from not just digging lots of holes, but the ultimate aim is to have this. This is Alex Beatty, who is now a supervisor at Oxford Archaeology, graduated two years ago from our degree programme. We want to have our students doing this when they graduate. Um, so the, the idea six, seven years ago was that we thought that single honours graduates in archaeology should be capable of working at PIFA level. We're not saying that they are PIFA because they need to have more field experience in a commercial setting before they can apply for that, but they should be have the skills that allow them to make that move very quickly. And we've thought very much that the degree should be, if you do an engineering degree, when you graduate, you expect to be well on the way to becoming the lowest grade of chartered engineer. That's the model that we have in our heads, is that an undergraduate degree should be fitting you to be Alex or somebody like Alex. So how do you go about doing that, apart from digging a lot of holes? Um, one thing is you need to talk to people and we have we think now a really good network of people within professional archaeology within the heritage quangos within um, local government archaeology and within um, what do you call something like someone like louise who works in there uh, Headlands Headspace lands, Landscape Partnership with a charitable aim of public archaeology that employs an archaeologist. We work with people like that. But our main long-term partners have been Oxford Archaeology, particularly their Lancaster office, because they're very close to us in Preston. Um, Mola, because Jim used to work there. Uh, and Wyass, because they're on the other side of the Pennines and we know people there as well. So we've built up particularly close relationships with those three organisations. And these are fourth year students uh, in Mola stores on a field trip that we run every year to tell, give the M size. Scared. Scared, basically, yes. <laughs> you think you know it all, but you don't yet. In terms of who we are, staff base, then we've got currently got seven people teaching archaeology at UCLan. Of those, um, more than 80% of those are MIFA. <coughs> They're MIFA level. Most of us, I think everybody but Vicky, has worked in commercial archaeology. So six out of the seven have worked in commercial archaeology and 50% of us have worked at project officer level or above. So the people, the, the academic staff, have significant amounts of commercial experience and Commercial experience at a level beyond the level that I've got commercial experience is that I spent a lot of time scraping mud for Wessex, but I never rose beyond the level of excavator. We also try to embed the, what the students do with that idea of a pathway to practitioner status. So we're encouraging the students to think of themselves as archaeologists and to think about their relationship to the Chartered Institute and a number of other professional bodies early on. So one of the things we did, the university had a drive, a large drive a few years ago to be seen to be getting value, giving students value for money for the £9,000 they're paying a year for their education. So there was a big drive to give, people, give students things over and above just an education. And the idea was that things that you required to do your degree would be provided for you. And we latched onto that and agreed 
and um, we've just got to pay the subs this year, haven't we? But you're the subs. Yeah. <laughs> but um, students who complete the first year on our degree, we enrol them all as student members of the IFA, of the CIFA, uh, and we keep that up for them for the, four, the remaining three years of two years of their program. Um, so they'll be student members until just after they graduate. Hopefully they then will be practitioners very shortly after that. They will certainly be in a position to move into the corporate grades membership, but they will have been embedded within that idea. They'll have, they'll have access. They'll see the archaeologist every time it comes out. They'll have access to the jobs bulletin. They'll think of themselves as belonging within that world. So these are the guinea pigs. These guys have just... Uh, these, this is for end of first year for the guys who are just finishing the fourth year now, isn't it? Um, and these, uh, these there with their brand shiny new um, certificates of student membership. To do that, we tried to take what we did in terms of field work and create a suite of modules that ran as part of the degree. Now, obviously, this is only part of a degree, and academic education has got to do lots of different things, but a suite of modules that ran as part of the degree um, that built from absolute novice to somebody who is approaching the level of practitioner status. So somebody who's got that, what you would regard as the core competencies to be able to go um, and fit, start to fill in the form, think about developing, looking at their um, CPD, thinking about developing a statement to put forward to make that application. And that process starts before the student even comes to university, because we do a thing called muddy start. So if you are uh, misguided enough to apply to do archaeology at UCLan, you will get a letter from me and Jim that says, congratulations on applying to UCLan. We know it's hard to find volunteer opportunities in archaeology. Come up one of our dicks. So we give them a week. Um, uh, this year it'll be either in Ribchester or up in, uh, on prehistoric site in Northumberland. Um, when they get to work alongside current undergraduate students, hopefully have a good time, hopefully form close remote, uh, emotional attachments and then decide that they are coming to UCLan after all. Um, so in some ways it's about our uh, spreading the message of what archaeology is a subject and also what the institution is, but from also it provides a really important reality check and um, Matt and Leo were talking about this, what is it actually like to be an archaeologist? Now this is nothing like what it's actually like to be a commercial archaeologist, but it provides a reality check in terms of this is what archaeologists do. If you dig a Roman fort in Lancashire, it's like this. If you dig a henge in Northumberland, it's like this. Rain will be involved, I'm guessing. <laughs> um, and so here we can see this is, uh, this is one of our current fourth year students, then the third year, uh, assisting with mentoring um, a, an applicant, that is Sean, who is now a student of ours, that works really well, um, at Ribchester to excavate, I don't know, what's that Jim? It was a Victorian trench. <laughs> <laughs> Once the student arrives, um, I should also mention we have, um, again, building on things that Matthew said, we've got a the university has a dedicated, what they call year zero program. So um, applicants to university programs who don't meet the A-level standards can do a course in their chosen subject at the university before they come. So we have an archeological program that takes people um, with non-standard qualifications or without the A-level points, and they do uh, two modules of archeology, span and we include those people in the year zero field work, and we give them additional field work opportunities as well. But all of that stuff that happens before the start of a traditional degree is very much focused on getting a realistic idea of what the processes of archaeology are, what it's like to, to work on site. Not so much about learning things, but just getting comfortable with being in that particular environment. In the first year, a student at UCLan, the first thing obviously we take in, there's lots of enrolment stuff, but week one of teaching is spent um, on an archaeological site. This is Ribchester again. Um, site uh, a small trench next to the big trench. These are these have been students at UCLan for about uh, three days at this point, and we brought them out to Ribchester. And we spend the week doing a little bit of excavation, generally about two days worth of excavation, mixed up with some geophysics work, some survey, some standing builds recording. Again, it's about providing the archaeological experience. That's part of a module, first year module called Introduction to Archaeology, which is a full of different introductions to different kinds of skills that archaeologists and academic archaeologists might need. So for example, um, here we are, we're very fortunate, we've got industrial archaeology just outside my office. Uh, so here we are, Old Canal Arch on campus, um, 
students doing a level survey, just set it up the W level and take it down and set it up the same uh, level runs around campus, all that kind of thing. Again, the kind of things that you guys were talking about with the molar training ship. Get outside, play with some stuff, learn how it works, become familiar with it, stop being scared of it. More practical stuff from that module. This is um, STIG, a medieval chapel just north of Ribchester. More geophysics, all standing builders recording. <coughs> this is also a taught module. So for two hours every week, somebody, often Jim, stands in front of them and gives them lectures on aspects of archaeological practice. What is a context sheet? Why does it need to be like that? How does a matrix work? All these kind of things. Throw in some other um, some more scientific techniques, things that we're in a good position to, to demonstrate. Some hand object handling stuff. I wish we had the collections you guys have because that would be fantastic to be able to have that resource. And I think that's one of the things where partnership could really take us a lot further is that you know if, if we've got the opportunity to work with teaching collections on a much larger scale, that would be brilliant. So by the end of the first year, our students have about two weeks field experience and about 52 hours worth of lab slash field uh, uh, practical type experience. At that point, we then ask them to choose a placement for the summer and they will do four weeks with either us or an approved organization, learning skills for our second year module in archeology, span which is called Archaeological Fieldwork One. What we're looking to do with this module is to develop their skills so that they can, th they can work as part of a team on site, so they can work with more experienced archaeologists. Um, they can get the standard records right most of the time when somebody's helping them. Um, they're working towards independence as field workers. You would not drop them on site at that point and expect them to be able to manage on their own, but they understand the processes, they're learning the processes. And one of the things, if you look at these slides, you'll see a great density of people on site. Every time we're working, we've got lots more people together in features than you would expect to see in a professional situation. And that's because the, stu the students are mentoring each other. More experienced students are mentoring less experienced students. Professional supervisors are mentoring them. We're looking over their shoulders. There's an awful lot of learning from each other going on. So that cobbled surface, you would hope to clean that on your own, wouldn't you? But look how many people are involved in that. <laughs> but doesn't it look beautiful? <laughs> We also try and do things that are not just field work. So for example, um, this is Ribchester, uh, working with local primary school children, um, involving them in the post-excavation process, helping them understand the process. We also have primary school children helping with the excavation uh, at Ribchester as well. Um, we've done similar things with other projects where we get, get um, schools on site, we get local groups on site, talk to as many people as possible, it can't hurt. The more people know about archaeology, the happier everybody in this room is, I think. But this is um, the core of that field practice on that year, is that you finish up with a situation where you might be dealing with quite a complicated deposit, Saxon skeleton here with a gas main driven through it, um, being excavated by a team of uh, the director, the osteologist, and then students of various levels around the hall dealing with various things under fairly close supervision. That is all assessed. That fieldwork is assessed. They get feedback at the end of every week so they can see how they're doing. And what we're looking to do is to see how people's skills are developing. It's not a yes, you can do it, no, you can't do it thing. It's how good are you at it at this point? How much practice have you had at it? Uh, and you almost certainly need more practice because everybody always does. So this is the grid we use at first year level. I won't dwell on that because we've got to keep moving. Um, we do a similar set of four week placements between second and third year for our students. And there we're expecting the students to be moving much more towards being independent <laughs> workers. We expect them to think for themselves that when they've finished a feature, they need to do the pavement work and they need to uh, there needs to be plans and sections to go with that feature and everything needs to match together and then they bring it to somebody else to check <coughs> it off. That is the aim at the end of that process. So 
typically third years digging might look more like this. If they're not mentoring less experienced students, they will be dealing with a feature in much less intense, in much less intense manner. And that's reflected in what we expect them to do in terms of assessment. Um, I can, we can, we could Dropbox this slide, some of these slides, but we could certainly make these um, these sheets available so people can have a look in detail of what we, how we're getting this to work. We've got another third year module which takes place in term time, which is focused on translating those field skills into the professional world, and that's where we really draw on our context. So here are. Third year students at YAS headquarters being talked to by Phil Weston about the role of the project officer. Exercises like this, classroom exercises, they've been given APs and geophysics results and they've got to try and make sense of where an evaluation could sensibly go within a particular corridor. And this is a genuine bit of third year field work report, sorry, a general bit of third year reporting from that module. They have to write a deep desk based assessment, they have to produce a written scheme of investigation, they have to write an evaluation report of some material. This is a piece of third year coursework from the desk based assessment thing. Those desk based assessments are not of a professional standard because they're still learning. But we know of students who've taken their undergraduate desk based assessment to job interviews and got jobs on the basis of having that they know what one looks like or they know what it's supposed to do. We run a four-year programme as well as a three-year degree, an MSI programme. Fourth years return to do more field work training. And here, importantly, we're expecting them to have a much higher degree of input in the management and the recording strategy. So particularly, uh, we'll expect them to deal with about 50 to 100 contexts independently. They will be being mentored by a professional archaeologist while they're doing this, but they have to drive the process. They have to gather the data, and what makes it particularly relevant for them is that then they've got to write that bit up. They've got to produce the report for that section, so these are fourth year <laughs> students working with archive material in the lab. Thank you. Um, and wrestling with the matrix and trying to phase it, uh, and all the things that you would expect people to do. Um, they get some tutorial support with that. They get about 16 hours of, of practicals and, and I'm often around when they're doing this stuff. They've got their four weeks thing. And again, they're being assessed every week, giving feedback. And this is where, building on what we just heard, the National Occupation Standards feed very strongly into the fourth year assessment grid. Um, so this is based on particular competency statements of what we expect them to be at when they're at the good end of that or the the less good end, and we can see the, the, the threshold level ought to be here, okay? Um, but realistically, if they're going to be going towards people, they, sh they should be in this, in this zone here. So, out of all that, we then get, hopefully, employable graduates. And hopefully I've just got time to have a little bit of a rant. Um, if we look, this is where people went, oh, it's fallen off again. Uh, that says working and, and study, that one there. But, uh, BSc graduates, we don't have data on precisely where they went, but we, we stalk the MSIs a bit more closely. We know where they went. And last year's MSI graduates went predominantly into commercial archaeology, quite a few into the museum and heritage sector, a few into further study, uh, one into another graduate job. Um, the, what we can see out of this is that this professional alignment is not harming the employment prospects of people who don't want to study archaeology, want to take archaeology further than an undergraduate degree. So the argument that a lot of universities make that they need to provide a general degree for everybody, whether they're going to do and be an archaeologist or not, is rubbish. If you do a degree in very professional-based archaeology, you will get a nice, rounded, employable graduate out of it who has lots of transferable skills. 